If you have a Bible, uh, the book of Titus, we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study through this, uh, this book. Today we pick up in verse 5 and finish this chapter through verse 16. And just a, a little bit of brief history. As you already know, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Titus in verse 4. It says, to Titus, a true son in our common faith. Titus, you might know, is Greek. He, so he's a Gentile. Most likely, Paul led him to the Lord because of this language here, a true son in our common faith. In the book of Galatians, he's mentioned, Paul talks about uh, taking him with him after 14 years of missionary work. He picks up Titus, and he's going to take him with him on an on a, uh, excursion. Uh, Paul wrote a couple of letters, actually three, to two young men that he was mentoring. One was Timothy. He wrote two letters to Timothy, and he wrote this one to Titus. They're known by commentators as the pastoral epistles because he's teaching them about pastoral leadership. Timothy, you might know, was half Jew and half Greek, whereas Titus was all Greek. So Timothy, being half Jew and half Greek, his mother was Jewish, his dad was Greek, so he was running for prime minister, and there's a huge debate. Was he Greek or was he Jewish? No, that's a joke. That, that's, a, that's not real. The letter he wrote to Titus was probably around 64, 67 A.D. Now, we're not sure when Paul was in Crete. But we do know that he was there because it tells us in this very first verse as we pick up the story, for this reason, speaking to Titus, I left you in Crete. The ultimate purpose, here, 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 if, you, if you want to know the ultimate purpose for leaving Titus there was to prepare the churches for a more biblical and Christ-like example to unbelievers. He wanted to infiltrate the island with that understanding. Where was Crete? Well, I'm going to throw up a map up here on the... Uh, there's Israel. That other little arrow that you see is the island of Crete. It was a, it's a large island. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the largest, most populated at that time, Greek islands. And today, it's still the 88th largest island in the world. It has uh, mountain peaks of over 8,000 uh, feet high. And Titus, uh, there on this island, he, he wants to show who Jesus is to the people as well as the leaders. And what a person who follows Jesus lives for and actually looks like. And let me just pause and just say this. That's really your calling and my calling as a Christian. To help other people see who Jesus is. And what he actually looks like. And how he actually responds to other people. Even on Highway 98. <laughs> and that's, a, that's a tough task, right? Jesus treated people different. He loved people. He, he transformed people. You might remember that story uh, in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, where, where Jesus is teaching there in Jerusalem. And it tells us that um, he was outside the temple telling people stories. He always had parables. It says all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman called in adultery. You know this story. 
and they set her in his midst and they wanted to test him. And they said, we caught this woman uh, in the act of adultery. Moses said we should stone her, but what do you say? And Jesus stoops down, he's writing in the sand, and, and finally he raises up and he says, well, and he, I, I maybe he points to the group of guys, I don't know, he says, let, let the one who, who has no sin at all go ahead and cast the first stone. And you know the story, nobody throws a stone. And then one by one, they begin to walk away. And Jesus asks her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now imagine the tension and, and the vibe, so to speak, in that scene when this woman is drug in there and these Pharisees with, with all their religious garb and all their self-righteousness are thinking, okay, let's, let's either trap him or let's stone this lady. And then one by one they leave. The woman, who I'm sure is completely undone, embarrassed, she, she, she's in the midst of all this insanity, where are your accusers, Jesus? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. <laughs> and Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. What an amazing story. Here she's caught in this situation, and Jesus somewhat lifts his arm down and pulls her up out of this pit and says, now, you know what? I, I forgive you, go, and you sin no more. And, and in many ways, that's the, that's the story of everyone who comes to Christ. We're, we're sinners, we're fallen, we're, 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 we're guilty. Others perhaps pointing the finger, or maybe you're pointing the finger at yourself. You come before the Lord and he says, I'll lift you out of this. But you go, and you live a different life now. You go and you sin no more. She was in a pit, I, I would submit to you, and Jesus lifted her out. Maybe you've heard this story before. A man fell into a pit, and he couldn't get himself out. And a subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. And an objective person said, it's logical that someone would fall down there. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in a pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into a pit. A mathematician calculated and did all the diagrams and the math and said, well, this is how he fell into a pit. A news reporter wanted an exclusive story on how he fell in the pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve that pit. A realist said, that's a pit. <laughs> An IRS agent said, are you paying taxes on that pit? A county inspector wanted to see his permit to dig a pit. A very self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. A wild charismatic said, just confess it, you're not in a pit. A pessimist said, things will get worse. Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. Because that's what Jesus does. Paul is instructing Titus to lift those in Crete out of ungodly lifestyles, out of poor leadership, and out of false doctrine, ungodly lifestyles, poor leadership, and false doctrines. This is sort of the summation of, of Titus. And, and he says, for, for this reason I left you in Crete, verse 5, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and to appoint elders in every city, or you could change that word every city to every church, as I've commanded you. The first task is to appoint qualified leaders. People who love Jesus, who 
who live for Jesus, who have a lifestyle that the best they can reflects Jesus in every city, every church, he says. You need qualified leaders. And Titus, you need to recognize them so that people know who their leader is. The, the word elder means mature, not necessarily old, but a person of, of character, a person who's an overseer. They call him a bishop or a pastor. The, these words are, are used interchangeably within the New Testament. But the number one top of the list for one who's qualified to do this has to do with character. And it says, if a man is blameless, verse 6, from the King James, the new King James. So the obvious question is this, who's blameless? Is there anybody who's blameless? So it's not someone who's free from all fault, but living in a way that, that they're not going to be constantly accused or, or exposed for some kind of sin or, or some kind of spiritual or moral failure in their life. Nothing that would lead others to live that way or cause other people to stumble. You know, they're not able to say, well, Pastor John snorts cocaine. It's okay if I do. Now, in 1 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, and these letters are somewhat dealing with the same issue. So, so Paul says to the other young pastor he's mentoring first in 1 Timothy, be an example to believers in word, in what you say, in conduct, and the actions are the way you live, in love, the, the way you treat others, in spirit being led by the Lord, and faith, your, your trust in him, and in purity, your conduct in life regarding opposite sex and your thought life. The, the, these things, these qualifications of those who, who should be elders or overseers or bishops or pastors. And after Paul tells Titus that elders are to be blameless, he, he points out here, a couple of things, a couple of areas, two very specific ones that have to do with critical issues in an elder or leader's life, and it's marriage and children. He says, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination... You could probably interpret that husband of one wife as a one-woman man, not one at a time, but committed to one woman. Now, obviously, Paul wasn't married. We don't know if he ever was or not. It never tells us, but he wasn't during this time of his life, and neither Jesus was never married. So it's not talking about that if your wife passed away, you could never marry again, or if you're biblically divorced. The idea here is purity and faithfulness to one woman, your wife, and to have faithful children. The best translation rending here is best understood as faithful children, not saved children. Even the best Christian dad cannot guarantee their children will come to salvation. That's a supernatural work of God that has to do with man's free will and God's sovereignty. But doesn't keep an elder, a pastor, a bishop from being a good parent. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he'll not depart from it is a, is a proverb. It's not a promise. But that's what you work towards. The em emphasis here is that the children are not living in a way that, well, the, the word here is dissipation and insubordination. Not their eternal state, but how they live now under your roof. The, the contrast is, is they're not to be wild, rebellious, disorderly kids. If you're going to lead the church, then you should at least be able to somehow govern your own children. 
The picture is if you can't control your kids and, and, and point them to Christ and live that way and bring some order into your home and use godly authority, then how could you ever do it in a church setting? The, and the exhortation is, is not condemnation, but prioritization. These are the priorities for someone who, who should step into that role. That they should, they should be able to be faithful to their wife, not have a lot of accusations floating around, and have their children under control. In other words, get home life together ministry to your family, your kids established. And so if you can't do that, well, you're probably not going to be very successful doing the other. You know, I've got three children who are grown now and 14 grandkids. Uh, we, we watched a two-year-old yesterday so our daughter could go canoeing with, with her husband and her other two children. And... Um, God bless you guys with two-year-olds. It's, it's, she's also right in the middle of potty training. So you have to constantly be asking. Because she's not in a diaper. I don't know if you live in that world. It's a very tense scenario. You're listening all the time for that sound. And aroma. But I'll never regret one morning, one single morning that I did devotions with my kids. I'll never regret it. Or, or having a family night with them as they were growing up. Or taking them to spiritual retreats when I could. Or on mission trips with me. Or, or, or putting them in an in a environment where I knew they would be affected by others, people who loved and lived for the Lord. Now, I don't have anything against sports. I, I played sports growing up. I, I served. I played football, baseball. My kids did. But, but I'm not thinking, I, I never have come to the place where I said, boy, I, I wish I'd have taken my boys fishing more. Maybe I should have. Or baseball games. Or movies. I, I wish I would have prayed with them more. I wish I would have spent more time developing their spiritual life. I, I, I did a lot of that. But, but, but this, this, this thing that's being discussed here has to do with, with the, the family and the spiritual temperature of your kids and the orderliness of them and the behavior and also loving your, your wife. It, and, and he goes on to use this word. He says he, he, in verse 7, for he must be blameless, a steward of God. You know that word steward means servant, means manager. It's somebody who cares for someone else's possessions. And that's what a believer is, be he an elder or she or whoever. You are taking care of, you know, we come into this world with nothing. We leave with nothing. Everything we have that's been given to us, we as believers are stewards of that for the Lord. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's who, who it owns. You're not taking it with you, right? Well, maybe you might try to stuff some of it in that box as you go. Rots a ruck with that. We're stewards, servants. We, manager, we manage and care for another possessions, the Lord's. We're like butlers. We're like waiters, janitors, chauffeurs, stewards of his word, stewards of his love. Caring for his people, his sheep. I like to use the term, I'm a, I'm a Bible butler. That's what I just, here you go, sir. Stewards of his word. I'm a Jesus janitor. Trying to do his thing. Keep his house clean. Stewards of the mysteries of God. And listen, as believers... Each of us who name his name or claim to be his, the very first thing that you and I are allowed to be stewards of 
is the simple but incredible privilege of our own personal relationship with God. I got to steward that. No one's going to steward that for me. I, I, I got to make that real in my own life. I got to pursue it to enjoy him, to know him, to trust him, to serve him, to obey him. You and I get this amazing privilege like Adam to walk in this, so to speak, garden of grace with the Lord Jesus Christ in the, in the heat of the day. I was going to say the cool of the day. But right now, in the heat of the day, and out, day in, day in, day out. Let me just jump ahead to, to, to chapter 2 real quick and say this is what we get. In chapter 2 of Titus, verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Man, that's who we are. And that's what we get to do. He mentions those things that can disqualify us. For a bishop, verse 7, must be blameless, a steward of God. And, and he mentions some things here that disqualify you from being a, a, a leader. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Self-willed, five things. Quick-tempered, addicted to wine, violent, and greedy for more. Self-willed, it's that person who always wants their own way. I want to do it my way. Proud, always right. Not a team player. Kind of an independent dictator. There must be this ability to, to work as a team that's essential to any leader. I always tell, I had a couple in my office this week, and we're talking about marriage and, you know, conflict, and I said, you know, conflict's inevitable in every marriage. And you can be right, dead right, but also very lonely being right all the time. How, do you, how many of you know that? Oh, I'm right. Yeah, but she's gone. You know, Jesus was right. Hanging on the cross, he was more right than any of us have ever been right. But he died to himself so you and I could be right in his eyes. And sometimes you got to die to yourself. And it doesn't matter who's right. It matters if the relationship is maintained. A self-willed leader will scatter God's sheep by being blind to other people's input, feelings, and opinions. He says it's, it's not possible for a leader to constantly be self-willed or quick-tempered. The Bible says in Psalm 145, verse 8, I'm going to throw this verse up here. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger. Aren't you glad the Lord's slow to anger? Amen. And most of us wouldn't be here. Slow to anger. And that's what he asks us to be, slow, slow to anger. Don't blow your temper all the time. A leader needs to have patience, not given to outburst of harsh and hurting words that destroy unity. No, no short fuses. Not easily offended or provoked. Why do you think God put all those cans on Highway 98? <laughs> and it's still going on after all this time. He said he's waiting for one person in this group. No. Not quick-tempered. Not, not addicted to wine. And that word means continually in the presence of it. That it has to always be there. Wine's not to be his companion, causes bad judgment, behavior issues. 
You, know, you don't want to call your elder, your bishop, your pastor late at night and go, hey, I'm, I'm at the ICU or, 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 or we're having this problem or someone's had an accident. Can you come? And he or she shows up. They've been drinking all afternoon. Yeah, I don't see any problem. No, you don't want to be that person. I'll never forget, this is way, way back in the early stages of the church where we were just getting started. We're over in this building. We had built our first Sunday school wing, and my son, Neil, who's helping lead the church now, just a, probably four or five years old. And I had been over to a friend's house the night before and had our kids with us, and we're just hanging out. And this guy said to me, hey, John, have you ever had one of these near beers? I go, What's a near beer? He goes, well, it's a beer, but it's not alcoholic. It's a non-alcoholic beer. Have you ever had one? I go, no, nah, I, really, I don't really drink beer. He goes, well, you should taste it. It tastes just like beer. <laughs> okay, so he pours it in a glass, and I'm drinking it, and my kids are seeing me drinking this beer. And my kids had already told me when I was drinking a Diet Coke once in a car, Dad, you shouldn't drink and drive. <laughs> so they're watching. So, so next day, Sunday, and I'm walking down the hall, and, and one of the, the guys who was on my board stopped me and said, hey, your, your son, Neil, asked prayer for you this morning. <laughs> I said, well, there's nothing wrong with that. He goes, no, he, he said, pray for my dad. He lifted his hand. He said, pray for my dad. He's drinking beer. And I said, well, let, wait a minute. Let me explain. He goes, you, John, if you want to have a beer, that's your... That's your, your, that's your <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 John, you don't have to talk, you don't have to answer to me. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, so, not violent, it goes on to say. Those who live by the sword will, will die by the sword. People who, who, who try to run over people and push their way through or shove their way through. Uh, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 3, I think it is. Well, I don't, I'm not going to throw that verse up there. Don't throw that verse up there. Yeah, throw that verse up there. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2, 24, 25. You guys got that one? Yeah. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth. You don't have to quarrel or wrangle with people. In Romans 12, uh, verse 18, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men, and I would add, and women, if possible. <laughs> if possible. These are some qualifications for, for, and it goes on to say, number five, they're, they're uh, not greedy for money or sordid gain, that you always have to have more and more stuff, who, who, who without honesty, integrity, you know, seeking wealth or prosperity at any cost. The Bible does say that a laborer is worthy of his hire, but never to turn the ministry into a money-making business. Paul mentions these five negative things, and then he goes on and mentions five, or actually seven positive things as he begins to describe and is encouraging Titus to set up leaders in these churches on this big island of Crete that demonstrate what it's like to be like Jesus and, and live in a way that people can see Jesus and so he says that they, 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 they can't be uh, self-willed and quick-tempered and drinking wine all the time and violent and greedy for money. But in verse 8, they, they should be hospitable. And, and hospitable means that, that, and everyone would know this as a believer, that, that Christianity and ministry is about people, being kind to people. To like people. In, in those days, there weren't a lot of hotels or inns for people to stay in. In fact, most of them in that day were houses of ill repute or, or some kind of, of uh, prostitution. And so when travelers would come through, 
they would usually stay in one another's homes, offer a place of, of safety and security. They're, they're to be hospitable, or to put it this way, a lover of what's good is a great statement. To see good, pure, healthy things, to, to promote those kind of things, to participate in them, to, to encourage it. He says, hospitable, lover of what is good. Not some secret life of evil. Not some mask that you live behind. But what's wholesome and good and, uh, and sober-minded. It takes seriously the call, the task. And here's why. Because you're dealing with eternity. You're, 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 you're dealing with, with uh, people's salvation. Avoid the pitfalls of the enemy. He, he, listen to what he says. He, he says, uh, lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. In other words, fair, doing what's right, not taking advantage of people. A holy life marked by God's spirit and character that you actually have a real personal walk with Jesus Christ. That's your self-control, not dominated by desires of the flesh. Uh, Galatian talks about fruits of the spirit, that, to be self-controlled and, and led by the Holy Spirit. Ver verse 9 holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both exhort and convict those who contradict. To counsel others with sound doctrine, not based on circumstance, not based on latest trends, not, not based on what's the political vibe that's going on, not what's cool or socially pressured, but help share with others what's the timeless truth, what, what's real. Because right here it says what's faithful and what's true. And what's faithful and what's true is God's word, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Sound doctrine. With the word, his truth, he's, it says he is to exhort and convict and with a working knowledge of scripture. Doesn't mean that an elder or leader is a Bible know-it-all. But he does have a good grasp of what's sound and what's unbalanced and what's not true and can, can discern that. I'll never forget one time when we, we, in the early stages, we had small groups scattered through, uh, you know, different, where was one over in Tiger Point that I would go to sometimes. And I remember a guy that was leading the small group said to me, hey, there's an older guy who's been coming to our group, and he's really smart. I, I said, what do you mean he's really smart? He goes, well, he opens up the Bible, and sometimes we just let him kind of lead. I go, who is this guy? I said, does he come to the church? No, he doesn't come to church. I go, well, how did he find out about the group? I don't know. Somebody must have told him about but he's been coming, and, 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 he's, and, he, and he really has a lot of good things to share. And I thought, well, I need to go see who this guy is, right? So I go. I'm sitting in the group, and his, his teaching was way off base. And one of the things he would teach was this, that there's really only one church in every city. And he was starting one in his home. And he was inviting people to his home that were in that small group. And he was teaching things that weren't biblical. So I came, I sat, I just listened. Next week I talked to the, the guy and I pointed out all the false teaching that this guy was permeating. And then he told me all the people from that group he had been inviting to his house for dinner and trying to get them to come to his house, the only true church in the city. So next week I showed up at the group again. But this time I was standing at the front door before he got there. And he's starting to walk up. I said, hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? I go, he goes, yes, sir. I said, 
have you ever visited the church that, that's uh, promoting these small groups? He goes, no, there's only one true church. I go, really? He goes, yeah. I said, well, based on what the, the owner of this house told me, you're no longer welcome here. He got really angry. He said, well, who do you think you are? I said, I'm the pastor of the other one true church. <laughs> In the city. <laughs> He's, what? I go, yeah, I actually pastor the church that all these people go to, and we started this group that they might be able to study the scripture together and to not be taught false doctrine. Are you saying I'm teaching false doctrine? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And he said some other things that I'm not going to repeat, and then, then he left very angrily. But I felt it was my job as a leader to refute false doctrine. And you have to. And in the situation and culture that we live in today, we have to do that. It was unbalanced, and somebody who leads should know the difference between what's biblical and unbiblical and balanced. And Because here's the deal. It says right here in verse 10, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And he's talking about those Judaizers, those Jewish people that would come in and be trying to tell these Gentiles on the island of Crete, oh, you got to be circumcised, you got to have these dietary laws, you got to keep these holy days, and, and, and they're false teachers. Jesus talked about wheat and tares being in the church. It's a mixture here that they're trying to bring in of Jewish legalism and tradition and mysticism. And, and Paul gives uh, three, some facts about what they do and who they are and why they are doing it. He says they're idle, vain talkers, verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. And, and basically they're just talkers, not servers, not people who are involved in helping with the ministry. He says in, in verse 12, uh, one of them, a prophet of theirs, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. They're, they're carnal and worldly. They, they, they deceived with Jewish fables, stories that would come out of Jewish lore or history that, that, that there weren't in Scripture but tried to make them think they were something they needed to follow. Paul mentions a similar thing in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. We have a, a verse I want. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia and Ephesus that you must charge some of them they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now, as these churches are getting established through Timothy and through Titus, there's all this Jewish baggage, so to speak, that they keep trying to bring in to these Gentiles' faith. People come up with some crazy doctrines. You ever heard any of them? Like, hey, everyone should be rich. If you're not rich, you don't have faith. Everyone should always be healthy and wealthy. You never go through a trial, never go through a problem. If you're going through a trial, you must lack faith. Our God wants to make me happy and joyful. And what I'm doing, even though it's not biblical, it makes me happy and joyful, so God must be okay with it. You ever heard that? That's like a four-year-old. I, we watched a two-year-old. I told you that yesterday, and she asked me this question. She says, Pop, what's your favorite Christmas song? I go, why do you care? <laughs> She's like, what's your favorite Christmas? She's two. And I go, oh, holy night. She goes, what's that? And I, I go, okay, little drummer boy. She goes, oh, I know little drummer boy. I said, that's your favorite? She goes, no. I go, what's your favorite? She goes, Jingle Bells. <laughs> I said, which one? She goes, what do you mean? Jingle Bell Rock or Jingle Bells Traditional? She goes, both. <laughs> I go, okay. She doesn't have no idea what I'm talking about. Neither does she. And that's the way some of these guys are. 
I was born this way. Have you ever heard that one? I was born this way. That's why I'm mean. I'm born this way. That's why I'm this or that. I, I love what Pastor Chuck Smith, who founded Calvary Chapel, says. You may have been born that way, but you're not born again that way. Amen. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And I underline the word all over and over again. All things become new. You don't stay the way you are. Churches during that time usually, usually met in homes. Uh, th that's why it says in verse 11, you know, they, they, they subvert whole households, teaching things they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. They, they, they come into these, these house churches. And, and they defile. Verse 15, if you go down to there, the, the pure, they, they quote this to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled, even unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. It, it's, it's interesting how people will use this verse to justify some kind of unbiblical practice or sinful action. Oh, to the pure, all things are pure. So I don't see it the way you see it. To justify seductive thinking or dressing or drunkenness or pornography or, 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 or some kind of, of weird, dirty humor. To, oh, I don't see it the way you see it. To the pure, all, all things are pure. Paul was talking about false teaching. That's what he was talking about. Concerning food and Jewish law and, 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 and regulations. And the Judaizers were saying, if you eat forbidden food, you're going to defile yourself. And if you refuse that food, you're more righteous. Paul said just the opposite. These teachers have defiled minds and defiled conscience. They look all innocent. The food items that they say are sin... Is false teaching. Their visions defile. But those who are clean are not defiled by false teaching because all foods are clean. Not the foods that are which defile, he says, it's the false teachers that are defiling. The principle is not about things we know are evil. For a believer to indulge in things that they know are wrong that are evil, and to say, well, they're pure because my heart is pure, is using the Word of God to excuse sin. That's what's happening. Paul tells Titus how to respond in verse 9 to exhort and convict that it must be stopped, to rebuke, to push towards sound faith, that a leader has to stand for truth. It, it, it's not just believing. It's what you believe. Truth or lies. But you see, you can choose. Listen to this and we're almost finished. You can choose what you want to believe. But you cannot change the consequences of that choice. You can choose what you want to believe. But you can't change the consequences. In John chapter 8, verse 32, I'll throw this verse up there. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? Make you free. And Paul's saying we, we need elders who, who stand for the truth, who confront that which is false. And, and, and these are some qualities in the life that should be there. L let me ask you a question about truth. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? Do you believe he wants a relationship with you? Do, do you believe that he's the only one that comes to you and says, hey, I can, I can pull you out of that pit. You don't have to stay there. I can change your life. You say, John, do you really believe that? Oh, yeah, I believe that. 
as a, as a high school dropout who was into drugs, who sold drugs, who traveled across the country and beyond, who was completely lost, involved in all kinds of sinful things in my life, Jesus came along and said, uh, uh, would you like to get out of that pit? And, and sometimes the pit can be pretty nice, right? It's not always bad. It, it seems like it's good for a while. And then it starts closing in on you. I said, Lord, if, if you can pull me out of this pit, pull me out. And he said, John, I, I, I stand at that door of your heart, and I'll knock. And if you'll open it, I'll come in. And maybe you're here today, and he's been asking you for a while, hey, do you want to get out of that pit? Do, do, you, do you sense or feel or, or think at times that he's knocking on the door of your heart and saying, oh, if you had just opened, I would come in? And the question is, obviously, have you ever let him in and started walking with him in a way that you know is real? It's one thing to come to church. It's another thing to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? And to walk with him. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to know that when you come to Christ, that he's always there for you. And to know you're loved by him. And that you're a special possession of his. And even when you fall, even when you stumble, he's there to pick you back up. And though all these others may accuse you, he says, I forgive you, go and sin no more. He's a good savior.